all together, how much, I mean, I guess a lot of taxpayers are wondering, how much is this going to cost? These are costs are all sustainable. But the cost, I mean, I, when we talk about health care, the cost to patients, I mean, we, we cost out health care very carefully. And, and again, uh, the, the costs of this are very sustainable. So we don't know the cost. All of these things uh, are sustainable. You, you don't have why a don't cost you? Why on don't you this get bill. Into it? You don't have a cost we on this bill. Uh, this is uh, very sustainable. Because you can't give me yeah, a cost. Good. I can tell you that the costs are sustainable and... Sir, I'm not even going to get into whether or not, you know, crime is at a 40-year low in Canada and whether prevention or rehabilitation is better than, than incarceration. I'm not even going to... Uh, the costs are sustainable in the sense that we are prepared to do what it takes. We don't govern on the basis of statistics. That is backed up by the statistics put up by the Department of Justice in 2008. Okay, Minister, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, very sustainable. Hi everybody, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Marijuana Man. Appreciate you tuning in once again. We're here to uh, do what we can to legalize marijuana. Now how about that video with Rob Nicholson? What a slime ball. These guys are up to no good, you can absolutely tell that. Now, all he can say is it's sustainable when he's asked the price of this new corrupt on crime bill him and the rest of the conservatives have introduced into uh, our lives. Now, these guys are such weasels. They come right out and say they don't govern by statistics. They don't govern by numbers. They must then be governing by an agenda that they're on. And that's certainly what they're up to. They have such an agenda here in Canada. War, oil, drugs, and the enforcement of drug laws. That's what they learned from uh, the Bush government when Harper went down there all those times to visit. That's what these guys are up to. And you watch, when Harper is finished with politics here in Canada, I'll bet you just about anything that boy will be involved with George Bush on some level in one of their wicked businesses. Now, the prohibition of marijuana here, it's just astounding and it astounds everyone that, that really thinks about it, why this plant is illegal and still illegal. Now, if you look back a, a little bit in history here, you'll see that the poor little plant just got uh, lumped in with everything. You know, they had uh, the prohibition of alcohol back in the 20s and 30s in the United States. And uh, the people at that time certainly saw that uh, prohibiting the substance that people wanted was causing a great deal of commotion and mayhem in their society. They saw that gangsters were now providing this substance. A black market had emerged that was bigger than it had ever been before. But at the same time, the government uh, instituted law enforcement against the prohibition of alcohol. So created a department of cops that would uh, go out and look after it. Elliot Ness was uh, very famous, the untouchables. Now, all these years later, these things are kind of celebrated and uh, thought of romantically, but uh, it was certainly a really bad decision. Society saw that that was happening and they overturned those laws. But what happened was that the men who were enforcing the alcohol laws did not want to be out of work, so they instantly glommed on to illegal other substances like opium, cocoa, and marijuana. Now, sometime early in the 1900s, <clears throat> see, coca and, and opium had been used for hundreds if not thousands of years, but certainly hundreds of years, and a very long time through the pharmaceutical industry in North America and the rest of the world. And they were used uh, quite nicely in tinctures and uh, different preparations of the natural plant. But what happened uh, in the mid-1850s, something like that, uh, companies like Bayer and other pharmaceutical companies synthesized both co the coca leaf and opium into cocaine and heroin. Now these became very dangerous and addictive substances and the society looked around and saw that they did not want this in their lives. Now nobody made an extra strong tincture out of marijuana. They didn't synthesize it and make it into a dangerous thing. But at that time the 
the feeling of prohibition was in these people's hearts and they did not like anything that wasn't the same as them. And they used this as an opportunity to put their thumb down on different races that they didn't like. The Chinese with their opium, the blacks with their marijuana, the Mexicans with their marijuana, the uh, cocaine coming from uh, people that didn't live there. The opium was coming from the Arab world. So they didn't think twice about squashing on these things. They made all three of them illegal. This was by 1920. So then alcohol prohibition came along. They threw that in the mix, saw that it was bad, repealed that 13 years later, but left those other three drugs where they were. Now, the men who glommed on to that, uh, from alcohol prohibition to drug prohibition, carried on, carried on with that and uh, made a pretty good living. These were the very men who came up with reefer madness and they continued, continued, continued to prey and push upon the illegal marijuana and that it was the demon of all demons. Now for centuries people had been trading opium and fighting over it. It became one of the world's biggest commodities. Coming out of the Middle East it was traded all over the world and the Dutch East Indies Trading Company, the, the British traded it. Uh, opium is probably one of the most popular substances in the world. Now. It all gets mixed up here when uh, we talk about marijuana prohibition. Where it, the marijuana prohibition that exists today is not because of marijuana. Let me tell you folks, it is a smokescreen here. They're using marijuana to put up as a poster child of their drug war. Now their drug war actually consists of the CIA, DEA, American government, going out there and securing all of the cocaine and heroin on this planet they are the ones that are selling it at the top levels. They get in bed with cartels and they sell it. They were caught in the mid 80s in something called the Iran-Contra affair. Now if you don't know what that is, look it up. It is horrendous what these men do. And they use marijuana as their little scapegoat. Now back in 1947 when the CIA was created, they took that opportunity at that time after the Second World War, they still needed a war. This is the deal on the planet here is that the industrial war machine wants to be at war at all times because they get to sell all the bullets, all the belts, all the boots, all the guns and tanks, and it's worth billions of dollars. So after the Second World War, they created a cold war with Russia. Out of the blue, they all of a sudden turned on Russia. During the Second World War, Russia and America were allies through the whole thing. But yet at the end of it, America turned on them and said, no, no, communism is bad. They dropped a couple of atomic bombs on Japan. Now you'll notice during the Second World War that neither Japan nor Germany, who were bent on supposedly taking over the world, neither one of them were communist. But all of a sudden, the day after the war ended, the communist threat was the biggest threat on the planet. And the American government was telling its people that <laughs> they're going to drop those kind of bombs on you too. So that gave them an opportunity to have an arms race, they called it. They, they had a race to build weapons. And that's what it was all about, building weapons, building weapons, the industrial war machine getting rich, rich, rich. Now in 1947 when they created the CIA, that was made up out of uh, some intelligence outfit from the Second World War, but the CIA was made, and it, it wasn't until a year later that they made an amendment to their mandate, and that amendment would give them the right to do whatever they wanted anywhere in the world at any time. But what they did right away and was to secure all of the countries that ran along the southern border of Russia and China, the big communist countries. They secured Burma and Laos and Vietnam and uh, Thailand and Afghanistan and all along the southern border. Now, coincidentally enough, every one of those countries was producers of opium. Now the CIA went in there in 1947, they had to be involved with the drug lords there to be involved in the country. They could not go in and just pretend and know that that existed and not take part in it. So they went in there and they secured the opium trade in that area in those years. And do you think they've ever let up? Not a chance. They went into Vietnam, 
to secure the opium running through Southeast Asia. They have been in all over the world pushing, pushing, pushing to control the opium. And they do. There's no question about it. They went into South America or Central America in the 70s and 80s and took over every country that was there. They own Central America. They kill people, they put in new presidents, they kill that guy if he's not right, they finance coups, they, they get the drugs, they sell the drugs in their own country <laughs> and everywhere else. But they get the money to buy the guns, to fight the wars, to do the bad stuff. Now, they're doing the very same thing in Afghanistan.